Yeah. Now, does that, is that, are you seeing the slide screen now? We're seeing the full screen, yes. Bye. Good. Um, so welcome to the Centre for Research Collections and Edinburgh University Library. Uh, which is the home of all the university's um, heritage collections. I'm going to be talking today with the help of our Wolf Vision ceiling mounted visualizer and some PowerPoint. And there'll be a couple of slight pauses at the points where I have to swap between the two. I want to talk today about a very local but influential strand of the arts and crafts movement. The modelled leather book bindings produced by a group of Edinburgh women from the 1890s up to about the outbreak of the First World War. Some of the women were associated with the Guild of Women Binders, a workshop and marketing organisation run by Frank Carslake, owner of the Hampstead Bindery, of which more later. But the Edinburgh group had an independent and distinct existence, and their unique binding technique was not practised elsewhere. The group was very much a product of Edinburgh society at the time. Edinburgh was then a capital city without either a royal court or seat of government, but was a huge centre for Scottish professional and intellectual life. The law, medicine, the church, as well as finance and industry. It was a centre for architecture, printing and publishing and design and art. And the people who ran all those activities were at the heart of um, Scottish affairs. By the 1890s, women were being admitted to the university, albeit in small numbers. And beyond this, there was a wide society of educated middle class women who were the wives and daughters of Scotland's professionals, who took a lively and intelligent interest in life and were able to pursue their ideas um, and interests and take them to a serious level if they wanted to. Some of the women needed to make a living by some of their craft work. Um, some of them needed to do so, but some of them were, were pursuing it entirely as a hobby. And this complicated situation is not entirely without consequences when it comes to identifying the work of individual women. In the 1890s, bookbinding had become popular as a creative pastime, pastime for women. It met with male approval as being decorative and clean and didn't require any great strength or necessarily much equipment. But professional male binders were very wary of their privilege and status and were often reluctant to allow women to receive thorough instruction. Uh, they would quite often allow the women only to decorate pre-bound books or only taught them how to carry out practical binding rather imperfectly. And the results of this can be seen on some of their work in the form of wonky end papers and not quite straight joints. But there was a, another side to this. Because no one had any, had any particular expectations of what the women should be doing, they were free to experiment and innovate. And in Edinburgh, this is just what happened. Annie S. MacDonald, who lived from 1849 to 1924, was the originator of this very unique molded leather binding technique. She was the wife of a senior officer in one of Edinburgh's insurance companies. Her social circle included John Miller Gray, curator of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, and Walter B. Blakey, who ran the publishers and printers TNA Constable. She and John Gray studied by old bindings in libraries in the UK and abroad. She clearly had the wherewithal to experiment and the self-confidence to visit the Edinburgh tannery in person, which ultimately produced the raw material she decided she needed in the form of thick, more or less undressed um, goat, skin, goat skin, very, very minimally uh, processed and quite thick. Blakey allowed the foreman of Constable's binding department to teach her and some other women binding techniques. She was the force behind this group of women binders in Edinburgh, 
and her practical and organizational skills were clearly key to its existence. Classes were carried on under the aegis of the Edinburgh Social Union, which was a movement for proper full out social reform in the city started by Patrick Geddes. And explaining this would require another paper all to itself. Um, and the classes also ran under the Edinburgh Arts and Crafts Club. The binding on the slide is in the collection of the National Library of Scotland. It's on a copy of Thomas A. Kempis's De Initatione. And this particular binding was used in the promotional literature for the first ex exhibition of the Guild of Women Binders in 1898. It's a very typical example of the sort of thing that they used to produce. The binder in this case is identifiable as Mary Dalrymple McLagan. And the bookseller who sold it to NLS a few years ago identified the source of the angel as coming as a Fern Jones painting. But it's now time we looked at some in our collections. So I need to swap equipment. And move across the room. <laughs> Thanks, Marga. I think we can get a little bit closer in on this. Okay. We have four examples of this type of work in our collections. The National Library have nearly 30. Um, there's a few in the National Museum of Scotland and there are other examples scattered in collections across the world. This one, I think, is the best of ours. The book is Francois Coppé Poesies, volume five, for some inexplicable reason, 1907. This was bought by our French department for the departmental library in the 1950s and subsequently transferred to us. Now, the first point is it is tiny. Um, it's sort of duodecimo sized. I'm not going to stick my hand in the picture because it'll upset the focus on the visualizer. Um, the leather, as you can probably hopefully see, <coughs> is this pale, basically uncolored goat skin, um, which when it went on would have been very, very pale, but it, it ages and darkens with time. I'll see how far we can get in without it going wonky. Perhaps about there is as good as, as much as is good for it. Um, so it's molded into a design in relief. Um, this was done with the leather wet and worked with a small tool called a Dresden. And I really would love to know more about the practicalities of the technique. Annie S. MacDonald's story was that only one tool was used. But judging from what I can see, I suspect that at least some of the women may have had more than one tool of the same sort. And that I do wonder whether some of them were using some sort of more conventional um, fillet tool, because there's a noticeable dis difference between bindings where uh, the straight edges of the frames and compartments are straight, as, as is the case on this one, and the examples where they aren't. <laughs> the design is worked by compressing the areas of background down, leaving um, the main part of the design raised. This one, as others of the very best of this work, has an actual sculptural quality to it, uh, because the whoever's worked it has managed to get some gradations of, of relief within the design. It's not just, not just um, up or down, um, it's shaded out. This example also, um, something which is quite common but not all the binders did, parts of the design, typically the background and worked into some of the um, 
worked in some of the areas of detail, so that on the little cherub's wings um, is a darker stain, which emphasizes, emphasizes the design and brings everything forward. This one also has some gold applied to the stars, and I think this is the only one I've seen this sort of thing on. The design itself is worked, just come out a bit. Um, the design itself is worked within a frame, and this is very common. Um, Annie MacDonald wrote an article about the work in the Book Lovers magazine in 1907, um, describing in very vague terms exactly what she did. Um, and she advises working the outlines first and then working inwards to complete the design, which obviously makes a lot of logical sense. And it would undoubtedly make it easier to manage the leather working if you've got the borders of the design established before you tried to do the detail. As a bookbinding design, unlike so many bookbinding the binding designs, it, it is an illustration. And this again is very common. It's the case with most of the designs of, made by the, um, the women in this group. This particular one does not, as far as I know, derive from an illustration inside the book, but others do. In style, it's very much of its time, arts and crafts, this one with a distinct touch of the Art Nouveau. The lettering is another very typical feature and almost all the bindings include it. The letter forms vary according to the style of the design and the maker's preference, but the chunky outlines are universal and some medieval letter forms such as those sort of crossed S's and the, um, the little sort of grid iron E's that you get in poesies and on the top line of this one um, are quite prevalent. <laughs> this particular one is blank on the back, which I might be able to show you. That's the back of it. That again is fairly common. Um, although it's also very common um, to find um, the initials of the binder and a date within the shield or a cartouche of some sort. And one very typical feature of this example is that the binder remains unidentified. This, I think, is the most accomplished binding of this technique that I've seen, and we have no idea who carried it out. However, that's not the case with all of them. And it's not the case with the next one I want to show you. Oh, I need to come out a bit further. Much. I think that's got the focus as good as it's going to get. Um, but the the tooling along the left hand side is not very deep, um, sort of down here. There is a date which you may or may not be able to see. This is our copy of an edition of the prayer book version of the Psalms in an illustrated edition, the binding decorated by Phoebe Anna Traquair. Um, this one's dated down the left hand side where it might or might not be in focus, 1898, and it was sold at auction at an auction of the work of the Guild of Women Binders at Sotheby's in December 1900. Now, Phoebe Anna Traquair is the big name of this group of binders because she had a much wider identity as an artist. Um, and she is the one person anybody might have heard of 
She worked in many media, including painting, embroidery, illumination, and also on a large num lar a number of large scale mural projects in public buildings in Edinburgh, which has kept her name, uh, name known to the public. She was originally Irish. She came over to Scotland with her husband, who was taking up a post of Keeper of Natural History in what's now the National Museum of Scotland. She had received art training in Ireland, and once in Edinburgh, she moved in the same circles as Annie MacDonald. Um, being friends with John Gray of the Portrait Gallery, she was part of Patrick Geddes's Edinburgh Social Union, and had contacts further afield, including correspondence with John Ruskin. Phoebe Traquair took her identity as an artist very, very seriously, and she signed everything she did. And inevitably, among this great portfolio of crafts and techniques, she took to bookbinding. And examples of her work dominate in public collections of this style of binding. And I suspect that this is because she did sign them and curators, particularly if they don't otherwise come into contact with this um, sort of binding, are happier to purchase a Phoebe Traquair than they are something by somebody unknown. But I really can't believe that Phoebe Traquair produced more bindings than all the other members of the group put together, especially as the quality of her work is surprisingly variable. The front of the Psalms here is beautifully designed. Um, she's in sufficient control of the medium to be able to put the lettering around the outside, um, which means that she has to shade off the relief between, I can get the um, mouse to show you. So between the edge of the lettering, there has to be a depression, but she manages to shade off that that depression between that and then the edges of the compartments, which are also lowered. Um, and that takes, must have taken quite a lot of skill. She also manages the tricky business of working the faces. And if we can go in and have a little look in more detail. Just focus on the top two. Um, Adjusting, no, the adjusting light's not helping. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, so she's got, um, you know, she's got the faces without them being clumsy and awkward and being actually thoroughly expressive. At her finest, she really does manage to sculpt the leather. Um, this one isn't quite as good as one I've seen in the National Museum of Scotland. Um, and the lighting and the visualizer aren't really doing it any favors. But you might be able to see um, in the, if you can see in the sort of the, the folds of the, folds of his tunic, um, she actually sort of sculpts the leather over the, over the shaping. Um, And the other good place is down on the arm here, where you actually get a sense of the muscles um, and the shape of the body. And there's some very, very subtle work with the tool gone on there. Um, so this is, this is Phoebe Traquair at her best. But if we... Go over to the back. Let's come out a bit further. The back actually isn't nearly as good because the, the shape of the shield really isn't quite right and it's not really quite symmetrical either. And the lettering at the bottom isn't quite straight either. Um, I've also seen a binding in the National Library, which has probably only survived thanks to her name, um, 
and that it, I think it stayed in the Traquair family for many, for many years, um, which might well be an earlier experiment before Annie MacDonald found the right leather for this technique. Um, and it's a leather that was too thin for it and tanned as was common at the time in a way which makes it disintegrate. Um, it's that leather that the Royal Society of Art started an inquiry about um, in the early 1900s, if that means anything to anybody else. Um, Now, one thing that require binding has, which is going to be very difficult to get into. You might be able to just see it there, is the stamp of the Guild of Women Binders. Um, again, the Guild of Women Binders are a topic all of their own. Um, and I'm going to put this down because I can't hold it up and talk. Um, we'll come back out and let focus take over. That sorted it. Yes, the Guild of Women Bookbinders is another topic all of its own, but it is a crucial part of the history of the Edinburgh Women Binders. In 1897, there was an exhibition held at Earl's Court called the Victorian Era. It encompassed many things, but there was a section entitled Woman's Work, within which, almost buried in the embroidery, was one case of book bindings, which included work by Annie MacDonald and Jessie R. McGibbon, who's another name in the Edinburgh group of women, and others from elsewhere. They were noticed by Frank Carslake, who's a bookseller and general businessman, who hosted a selling exhibition in his shop the following winter, featuring the work of the same women. Annie Mac MacDonald participated in this and followed it up because we think she was quite keen to have an outlet for her work in London. And the Guild of Women Binders was born in 1898. It held a series of selling exhibitions, including one or two in North America. Um, Carslake was also running a commercial bindery staffed by men and started a training bindery for the women at a price and at the price I think of working for him afterwards. The men did a lot of the binding for the women to deck, de to decorate. Constructional standards in general were not high. Um, it seems that Carslake was just a businessman, was just in it for the money, and he didn't understand or really buy into the arts and crafts ideal of high standards of construction or good materials. Some of the women produced good work with a high standard of design, but it actually wasn't enough. Um, it turned out that they could make more than he could sell. In 1904, he went bankrupt. And subsequently, the, the history of the Guild and the women and what came out of it is clouded by, I think, a lot of people being hurt by all this and that he wasn't terribly honest about it. And it seems that in years subsequent, a lot of people wouldn't admit to having worked with him. However, the Edinburgh women were at a bit of a distance from this. Um, nobody at the Hampstead end of the operation used their technique as far as I know. And their classes in Edinburgh were really completely independent of it. And actually in the end, even Annie MacDonald hadn't sold a great deal through it. But frustratingly, the Guild of Women Binders is often the only recognizable name that Edinburgh bindings turning up in libraries can be used to describe describe them in a catalog for it well for, for there to be any hope of the book being retrievable um, in any way that's recognizable to anybody this this is a problem because the um, 
the work that was going on in Edinburgh was separate from the Guild. Um, a lot of these books are turning up without the Guild of Women Binders stamp on them. And yet there's no adequate way of describing them um, on their own terms. So I'll talk a little bit more about anonymity. When the focus catches up with us. Oops. Of the four bindings in our collections, we have the one signed by Phoebe Traquair, which was bought a few years ago. Um, this one uh, we bought at auction earlier this year. Um, and there it was barely mentioned in the auctioneer's catalogue and was actually lurking behind some more glamorous but very different bindings, which are in the front of the picture in the lot in the auction catalogue. Um, and I suspect that if the National Library had seen this before we did, they might have bid on it. Um, the other two books, the first one we saw and the remaining one, which I'll show you in a minute, we found unrecorded on the shelves in special collections, evidently secured by some far-sighted predecessor of ours at a date before the library had uh, any system for cataloguing bindings other than the sort of gold tool glamorous Scottish 18th century ones. Elizabeth Cumming, who is the expert on Phoebe Traquair, and in the course of her research um, into the arts and crafts movement in Scotland in general, has done quite a bit about these bindings, um, has tentatively attributed the other one of these bindings, I'll show you in a minute, to Jessie, Jessie McGibbon. Also confusing, um, the National Library have one which has worker Mrs. MacDonald penciled on the flyleaf, which attribution their cataloger has queried on the basis that there's another copy of the same book signed by Annie MacDonald in another library. The volume in the National Library has the initials HFC on the back, which is almost certainly going to be the, um, going to be the name of the binder. Uh, but I don't think anybody's quite put these pieces of information together to work out who it was. And the problem with that one is that the book itself was published or at least issued for the Guild of Women Binders and has their name on the title page. And clearly rather a lot of members of the Guild of Women Binders had a go at it. Some of them, of course, possibly more than once. And there are probably quite a few of them around. Um, But there was another issue behind all this, and it is very much that of women's work and women's status in the late 19th century. Um, how far are these unsigned out of recognition for a, bind, a tradition in book binding that bindings often aren't, although these are definitely not routine trade bindings, these are definitely works of art. How far are these women who are not confident of their own work and their own status? How many of them are not signing their, bind not signing their bindings out of social pressure to not admit to doing this sort of thing? How many of them were just doing it for a hobby? And how do you distinguish them from those who were taking it very, very seriously? And it's certainly the case that these are art rather than just craft. Um, between the selection of bindings we have here, you can see several different ways of handling the tools and several different ways of approaching the design. I've mentioned Phoebe Traquair working in a sculptural fashion. 
Jesse McGibbon produced fine minds and had a delicate touch. So I should come to that one in a minute. This particular binding was not intended for sale. Um, it's not as expert as some of the others. The little flowers are a little bit clumsy. The certain amount might be explained if we go inside where it has on it the name of Johanna Caird Ross. It's the poems of, of, Rossetti, of Rossetti, by the way, in a fairly undistinguished Tauschnitz edition from 1873. But this looks like a book that Johanna must have owned previously. Um, and inside it, <coughs> There is a postcard which is actually fixed into the binding with an inscription on the back of it that you may or may not be able to read, which says, Johanna, wishing her a happy Easter, 1904. So, but, but the message is unsigned. So it does look suspiciously as though this has been a gift to her from a friend or a relative or somebody who obviously meant a great deal to her um, and probably to whom also this particular passage of Rossetti meant a great deal. Um, it's clearly a very, very personal gift, but we don't know who. Um, Johanna Caird Ross was the daughter of Thomas Ross, an Edinburgh architect and business partner of Jesse Rentoul McGibbon's husband. Um, so you can see the, the connections between all of them. So we'll slip in. This is, this is the one that Elizabeth Cumming has attributed to Jesse Rentoul McGibbon. And this is another very fine piece of work and fine in every sense of the word. It looks as though the leather is a little bit harder than some of the others, but she's got much finer detail um, work. The lettering is a little bit less chunky than some, some of the others. Um, and the detail of the little, little border down at the bottom and this seems to be typical of Jesse Rintoul McGibbon, but it's unsigned. Now, I want to come back to the PowerPoint at this point, which means sharing, stopping sharing the screen, coming back over to the... It's only going to do it from the beginning, isn't it? There we are. One thing I did want to stop and think about for a few minutes is the sources of influences um, that were behind the development of certainly the designs and to some extent the technique. Because um, um, clearly these bindings didn't come out of nowhere. Annie MacDonald gave some information which was used in the Guild of Women Binders publicity and in this magazine article in 1907. She cites having visited and looked at books in the Bodleian, Durham Cathedral, the British Museum and abroad. She doesn't mention anywhere in Edinburgh. She also alludes to contemporary pigskin being unsuitable. Uh, we're all fairly sure that she was referring to German alum pig pigskin bindings as on the left. Um, but the designs and the imagery used on those bindings 
and on most British bindings, stamp bindings of the same period, don't seem an obvious inspiration for the sort of work she produced. Um, and certainly the British panel stamps I've always been most familiar with have not been illustrations. They've tended to be um, sort of armorial designs or um, stylized emblems and so forth. Um, but it does look as though that is just a matter of which library one finds oneself in. As Daryl Green has, having been shown some of our bindings, uh, produced uh, an image like this, which is one of the panel stamps of the London binder John Raines, which is much more illustrative, much livelier. And in general terms, you can see how somebody looking at that might go away and come up with some of the sort of things that we're seeing on these bindings. There's certainly nothing quite like that obvious in Edinburgh. Um, so maybe she did find something like that in Durham. We shall probably never know. And of course, these were not the only molded leather bindings being produced either in Britain at the time. Um, there were other groups producing them, even some um, in some ways connected with the Guild of Women, Women Binders. Um, the Chiswick Art Workers Guild produced some. There was a group of women in Kirkby Lonsdale in Cumbria and a scheme for the employment of disabled children in Leighton Buzzard. A not notable graduate of that group um, one Alice Shepherd later worked for Cedric Chivers in Bath, although I gather that they worked the leather from the back um, and filled up the sort of the, the cavities that they created with a filler for the leather to keep its shape, whereas the Edinburgh women worked from the front on a much thicker, tougher leather um, and let it hold its own shape. The really unexplored link, however, is between these bindings and the molded work leather being produced in Germany and elsewhere at the same time. Modern sources frequently refer to the molded leather work coming from Germany in the late 19th century as an influence on these bindings in Britain, but nobody ever illustrates them. The name usually cited is Jörg Huber. Um, and I suspect that this connection originates in a comment in an article, review article in the Art Journal in 1898, reviewing the state of modern bookbinding and discussing the Guild of Women Binders. And it's a throwaway mention of Hulber. He had a big workshop in Hamburg uh, where he, he and presumably his firm uh, produced mostly furniture and wall hangings and household objects, although there were some books. This image, I'm afraid, I stole off ABE Books the other day. And the volume is a commemorative album made for a railway company. And this seems to be typical of the books that they produced. I'm not finding any evidence of their work on ordinary printed book bindings not even in the way that, for example, Scottish Mocklin ware appears on uh, books sold to tourists in Scotland. Um, some of the articles which mention Hulber also mention one Herr Jacobson, um, one of his pupils who apparently worked in England, and he remains completely elusive. It would be quite good because I suspect there's a lot of people here today who know much more about German leather working and German binding of the period, who might be able to suggest some things that Annie MacDonald might have seen on her travels, assuming that she'd been abroad, um, and see whether there are any other points of contact or anything else that she really might have taken seriously in developing her binding style. Certainly what I'm finding on um, the, sort of the websites and usually the digital image sites, the German libraries and museums, the bindings from this period are generally just as sort of Art Nouveau as their British equivalents. 
there's a real gap there. We'd love to hear from somebody if anybody knows. This has been a presentation of as many questions as answers, and it is the beginning rather than the end of my research. I'm very aware that I've seen relatively few examples of what I've been talking about, and I've only been able to pay one visit to the National Library of Scotland, and therefore only to see their most recently acquired bindings, which are catalogued online and therefore could be pre-ordered. I now have a list from their paper catalog of the rest, which includes all their holdings of Annie MacDonald's work, for example. The story from here may be as much um, social history as technical binding history, although it would be fascinating to understand how they worked the leather. And I really would love to hear from anyone who has examples of, of this sort of work in their collections um, or other ex similar examples of women bookbinders working outside the mainstream elsewhere. And thank you very much.